guys, welcome back again. Today I'm going to be reading the same book, A Tale Dark and Grim by Adam Goodwiss. I'm, re- I'm going to be reading chapter 3 and it's called Brother and Sister. So let's get started. Once upon a time, a brother and a sister clasped hands, one of which was missing a finger, and strode out of the White Mountains across Green Hills and into a large and wonderful wood. Trees towered above them like pillars of heaven strong and straight all the way up. Birds sang and flitted by their faces. Little rodents, chipmunks, squirrels, mice, dashed in and out of the underbrush. A fawn appeared and looked at them from behind. A stand of ferns and then bounced off of his mother. Everything was greener here, more full of life than anywhere Hansel and Gretel had ever Hansel and Gretel had ever been. The vibrant power of the palace began to take hold of the children. Hansel rushed out ahead of his sister, bounding through the ferns and then running back again, like a dog that's been let out of his tether. Gretel laughed and sang and collected blue bottles and daisies and wonderful wild flowers. We could make a life here, she shouted to her brother. Hansel hooted with delight and took off after a low flying blackbird. Soon the two, two came to a clearing where there, where, they, where there stood a magnificent tree. It rose to such heights that they could barely make out where the lowest branches began. <laughs> Though they could see, if they looked really hard, a crown of green far above them. Gretel jumped when she noticed in a wood tree, in a wood of a tree, what appeared to be a woman's face. <clears throat> it was made of bark with brown hair wrapping around its smooth cheeks and wide eyes. Gretel walked up to it, mesmerized. What a magnificent tree, she said. Thank you, the tree replied. Now you might have expected Gretel to jump or Hansel to fall backward over a conveniently placed rock, but neither did. The tree's voice was gentle that neither children were startled at it. Welcome to my wood, she went on. It is called the Levenwald, the wood of life. That's pronounced Levenwald. Levenwald. Go ahead and say it. German is fun. Plant something that you went on and watch it sprout before your eyes. Spy on the wild beasts and see them leap and bound and grow. You too will grow here and live and be happy. Her woody eyes drifted over them and then she asked invitingly, <coughs> Do you plan to stay? <coughs> Hansel looked to Gretel. She nodded and said, If you don't mind. I don't mind that she smiled and then asked, But I ask of you of one thing. Please take no more than you need. Life here exists in a delicate balance. Do not upset it. Then she told them that, less than a le- uh, leak hence, lay a lovely spot where they could build their home. The children thanked the tree, but it is always best to thank talking trees. Then they bid her farewell and started for the place she had told them of. They soon came to a small clearing. Some large stones were particularly burned, buried in the earth there, and nearby the brook burbled and bobbled over smooth rocks. The sun shone in through the green. The sun shone in through the green leaves. Hansel and Gretel gr- agreed that this was the place the tree must have meant. They gathered fallen branches and f- fronds of fern and laid them against the great rocks, so that the little hut, so that a little hut was formed, half gray, half green. They gathered more ferns as well as moss and leaves. They made two little beds for themselves, side by side. Then Gretel gathered seeds to begin a garden and Hansel gathered nuts and berries for supper. That night, they feasted. Gretel swore that nothing could make her happier, and Hansel agreed. They decided that they needed nothing else, certainly not parents, and that they would be able to live happily just like this for the rest of their lives. Yeah, right. Oh, did I say that out loud? The next day, Hansel was gathering food for our dinner as Gretel tended their garden. He walked beneath the towering trees and heard the birds singing as they flitted by, and he thought, what life! What excitement! I want to be part of it all. Just then, a brown rabbit ran across his path. Hansel felt his legs twitch. Before he knew it, he was pursuing the rabbit through the underbrush. As the sun set that evening, he walked back into the clearing, exhausted but as happy as the chirping birds. He had the rabbit in his hand. It was dead, and he placed it before Gretel on the ground. Now we must make a fire, he said, and eat it. But Gretel was upset. Why did you do it, she asked. We don't need this. Suddenly, Hansel felt sorry for having killed the small beast, though he enjoyed hunting for it, hunting it so. They made a fire and cooked the rabbit and ate it so it would not go to waste. 
but Gretel made him promise not to kill any more animals. We have everything that we need here, she said. Remember what the tree told us? He felt bad and promised. But the next day, as he walked through the woods looking for nuts and berries, he saw a tiny baby fern, nosing a sand of fern. His legs began to twitch again and his heart began to race. He remembered what his sister had made him promise. He told himself to turn away, but there was something about the air here, the color of green, the musty scent of the wood, that made him want to burst as he watched the tiny fawn among the fronds of the fern. He couldn't help it. In a flash, he let off after the frightening creature. As the sun set that evening, he walked back into the clearing, exhausted but as happy as the little animals that run among the underbrush. Over his shoulder was slung the fawn. He placed it before his sister on the ground. What have you done? she cried. He attempted to calm her. Now it can eat meat for a whole month, he said, and I won't have to kill another animal for a long, long time. She looked at him in disbelief and then began to whip bitterly over the dead fawn. What? Why did you do it? she muttered. All we, ha we have all we need here. Remember what the tree said? Handel suddenly remembered once more and remorse swept over him. That night, he tossed and turned. He was furious at himself. Hadn't had she told him? How did they both told him? Don't take more than you need. He and Gretel had eaten as much of the fawn of the fawn they could eat at night, and it looked as if they hadn't even touched it. Now the carcass lay outside on the grass, attracting flies. Its stench wafting over their beautiful clearing. As Hansel stared at it, he vowed to be his own master, and not let his impulses carry him away. The next day, before he went out to find fruit, Gretel made him swear on his very life that he would not kill nothing else. He swore it, and he hugged her and kissed her for being so good and so forgiving, and he promised he would do nothing violent ever again as long as they remained in the forest. She kissed him on the forehead as if he were much younger than she, and sent him off for the nuts of fruit. Uh, for nuts and fruit. He spent the whole day basket, basking in the lovely green light of the leaves, picking berries and storing them in his tattering shirt, which he had tied around his waist like an apron. He felt the peacefulness and calm of the forest, and he wondered why he hadn't always been able to feel it, why he had been overcome the last few days with that uncontrollable animal lust. Then he saw a white dove perching on a nearby branch. Something tingled in his legs and arms. Don't, he told himself. It's wrong. He started to shake. Go home. Turn away and go home. But he found himself creeping in the direction of the dove. The berries fell to the ground. As the sun set that evening, he walked back into the clearing, exhausted but as happy as a saddened wolf, blood covering his arms and his face. He carried in his hands the broken blood covering his arms and his face, and he carried in his hands the broken, eviscerated caragas of the white dove. Gretel screamed when she saw him. What have you done? She cried. Hansel, what's wrong with you? Hansel stopped. Then he looked down at the dead bird. He noticed his arms were covered in blood, and his shirt was stained with a mix of blood and berry juice. He wondered where the berries were. Gretel began to cry. Cry. Hansel, confused and upset, placed the dead dove at her feet. She backed away from it, covering her face. He looked at her and felt awful, but not as awful as he felt the night before. He turned and walked into the woods, walked back into the woods. Greta saw Hansel only inf infrequently after that. Occasionally, she was out collecting berries and she saw him running through the forest after some animal or other. At, at first, she had to, she had, he had stopped to speak with her, just a few words each time, but soon she noticed that words were not coming as easily to him as they once had, and he was ever, he was ever and always looking off his shoulder or following the flight of birds with jerky needs of his head. Soon he wasn't stopping to speak with her at all. She found animal caragas littered all over the forest. Some were half eaten, others barely touched. Once she found a wild boar larger than Hansel with its neck broken. She wondered how Hansel had the strength to do such a thing. She wondered how he had the heart to do it. She saw him only in flashes now. A blur of skin through the trees, a screaming, a scream of a dying animal, and then a howl of delight. She thought he looked different. He was growing hair on his face and on his back. She was frightened to be in the wood by herself, particularly at night. She heard howling and howling that she hadn't heard when they first come to the lead leaden wall. She wondered if it was Hansel. She stayed closer and closer to the hut for fear of seeing him. Then one day, he wandered into the clearing. As the sun set that evening, he walked back into the clearing. 
exhausted but as happy as a sated wolf. Blood covering his arms and his face, and he carried in his hands the broken, eviscerated tear gas of a white dove. That, then one day he wandered into the clearing. Gretel stared. He walked bent down. He had hair all over his body. His arms, his back, his face, his chest. Wordlessly, she offered him a handful of berries and nuts. He snarled at her. She dropped them and hurried into the hut. He growled and stopped the clearing for a few minutes. Greta wondered if he would, he would kill her, but he left. There were fewer animals in the forest these days. Greta heard no birds and song. She saw no rodents darting in and out of the underbrush. No deer, no the stands of fern. And then one early morning, a hunting party, a duke and his household entered the world, the wood. They blew their horns and their hounds. They blew their horns and their hounds bayed and barked. Gretel feared for, feared for herself, but more than that, she heard for, she feared for Hansel. She crept into the hut and stayed there all day, hoping he would come to her. The dogs and huntsmen scoured the forest for some sign of animal life. To their surprise, they found none. All day they searched, and all day they found nothing. The duke became angry and impatient, and then at dusk he saw a strange, hairy, hunched creature peering out from behind a large tree. There he bellowed, and instantly the dogs were in pursuit. Hansel fled through the wood, thrilling at the terror of the chase. The dogs bayed at his heels. The horn sounded all around him. He dodged his way, and that panting, growling, laughing, howling. What fun, he thought. What tremendous, terrifying fun. At last, he came to the edge of a brook. Across the way, he, Duke, sat astray his horse, his bow string pulled tight, an arrow knocked and aimed at Hansel. The animal boy stared curiously at the sweating red-faced man, holding the strange bent stick. Then there was a snap and a hiss like a snake. An arrow flew through the air, a straight, simple harbinger of death. Hansel watched it all the way to his chest. To exactly where his heart was. It buried itself there. He felt a searing bolt of pain and fell to the forest floor. Forest floor. The huntsman tied the strange dead animal to the pool and carried him triumphantly back to the duke's manor. Man the next morning, Gretel ran through the wood looking for her brother. For a long time, she found nothing but broken branches and paw prints. Then, at last, she came to the brook and saw the earth stained a copper red and rocks at the water's edge splattered with blood. She ran to the tree with the face in it. My brother has been killed, she cried. He has been killed. But the tree would not speak to her. Gretel fell to the ground and sobbed and sobbed. She was alone in the great forest in a dark tail. Her father tried to kill her. She'd been nearly eaten by a baker woman and cut off her own finger. And now her brother Hansel was dead. She would not stay in the, that forest for not now. I need to go back to people, she said wiping tears from her face, to grown-ups. When she left the wood of life, she saw a bird alighting in a new tree nearby. Soon she could hear the sound of birdsong again, but it only made it hurt more. They only came back, she knew, because Hansel was dead. We're at one of those places in the story, and that happened, um, nearly all stories, and any kind when things seem to be really, really bad, when it feels like if things get much worse, we won't be able to listen anymore, when I was little, I used to call this part the sad part. I knew it would happen in every story, and I knew it always ended eventually. And I would repeat it. This is the sad part. That is that is the sad part. Over and over until it was done. And, um, and so I pierced these stories together, and I came to the part, and I realized that this was the sad part. And I repeated this to myself again and again to try and make it not feel so terrible. But it didn't help. It, it never does. It still hurts when a character you love dies, and another one is left all alone in the world. Nevertheless, I will tell you, and as I always tell myself, that things will get better. Much, much better. I promise.